Well, first of all, before I get into the message, let me just first say a huge thank you uh, to so many of you who have been praying for Monica this week, and coincidentally, by extension, praying for me and Austin and Blake um, as well. She is home, and um, she is... Uh, slowly recovering I guess um, but I know many of you have been praying many of you have sent text and a few of you stopped by and many of you have already signed up for the meal train that the church will be doing um, for our family but I say a huge thank you uh, one because I told somebody earlier mercy is not my spiritual gift and um, so I'm trying to do the best I can to, to care for my wife um, and I'm sure it's failing miserably um, but I did make boiled potatoes potatoes last night. I know it's a real sophisticated dish. Um, you got to cook those potatoes just right um, to get them there. But um, so I just wanted to say a huge thank you because you guys have encouraged us in a lot of ways uh, this week. Um, and so I did want you to know that she's there and I left Blake home with her. We'll see if that was a good decision or not um, when I get home. But, um, but I appreciate uh, all of you who, again, have been praying. Um, some of you have already sent cards and things like that. And um, it's just special to a pastor when, when you guys are just caring for us that way. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, it really does. And so I wanted to start off by just saying a huge thank you for that. I, I figured it up this week. And throughout my lifetime, I have heard uh, probably about 30,000 sermons. Uh, I was, I've been in church all my life, and, and I grew up in the age of, at five years old, you were in big church, and you went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, um, and so, I, you know, my family was consistent in all that, and then I've been to a lot of conferences, I've been to some conferences where I've heard six or seven different messages in a day uh, over the course of a week, and, and all of that, and, um, and so I figured it up this week that probably close to 30,000 sermons I've heard uh, over my lifetime. Some of those servants have changed my lives. They really have. Some of them um, have given me a new perspective on things. Some of them have uh, gotten me reoriented to the gospel. Some of them have gotten a vision in my heart. Some of them have given me a mission to go and accomplish. And some of those have just sort of went by the wayside and I didn't uh, get anything out of them or whatever. And I've come to realize that's probably more on my part than it was the person delivering it. But, um, but that happens. And, and so some of those messages have really been effective, really changed my life, and some of them maybe not so much. But what I did realize is that there were a lot of times that I've heard a sermon and a preacher would use a verse and make a point, and while I got I understood the verse and while I got the point, I, I didn't really understand much about it. In other words, I didn't understand the context. I didn't understand the writer. I didn't understand what he was trying to say. What was the point, the big point he was trying to make? Yes, I understood the point of that verse or that passage, but what was he really trying to convey? And so that's part of what I like to do a couple of times a year uh, is, is take a couple books of the Bible and we're just going to go through those books, over the, uh, we're going to go through a book over the next several weeks and try to give you that, try to give you the background and the context and the, the setting and, and what the author was, was, was writing to and what he was trying to convey to the, the people that it was written to. And, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the book of Colossians. I was debating between Colossians and Ephesians and James. Uh, James is my favorite book because it's so practical uh, that you don't have to say much. You just read a verse and it pretty much tells you what you need to be doing. But I also did James last year, so I, I, I X that off. And I came down to Colossians and Ephesians. And, and Colossians has been really um, powerful in my life this year. In fact, our church verse of the year, Colossians 2.7, uh, I introduced that back in January. And it has been in our bulletin and it's been on our hearts. Uh, many of you have memorized that scripture that we would be rooted in Christ. Christ. And, um, and so Colossians is where I came down. And so that's what we're going to do for the next several weeks is to, to go through the book of Colossians. Now, how many of you that are parents tell your kids, don't do the bare minimum. We want you to do the best you can in class. All right. Here's my message to you. I don't want you to do over the next four weeks the bare minimum. I want you to do the best. So here's my challenge to you. 
Uh, we don't have enough time to read every verse and break down every verse of every chapter. And so my encouragement to you is at some point this week, go back and read Colossians chapter 1, the whole, the whole chapter. We're only going to take a portion of that this morning and blow it up. So I'm going to encourage you to, to read the whole chapter because there's some stuff before what we're going to read and there's some stuff after what we're going to read uh, that are very important. And then I'm going to challenge you to do this. Before next Sunday, read Colossians chapter 2. Now you could do both of those in about six minutes uh, of just sitting down and reading it. So um, I know many of you would say, come on kid, don't just do what you got to do. Do what's going to be the best. And so I, I want to encourage you to do that um, as we go through this. So we're going through the book of Colossians. Let me just start out by giving you some background. This isn't going to be exciting stuff. Uh, you're probably not going to sit here in the next few minutes and go, wow, I had no idea. But you're probably going to learn some things that you didn't know. Now, the book of Colossians um, was written, written to a church. It was written by Paul. Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, so that's not unusual and that's not strange. But one of the things that we realize about this letter is that Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. So it wasn't that Paul was just having a party and living the life and, and everything was going great for Paul. He literally was sitting in prison. And unlike today, prison did not have uh, cable TV and it did not have um, all of the amenities that we have today. And so Paul was writing this letter to the church in Colossae, Colossae um, which had the Col Colossians. Um, one thing you need to know about that city is one of the largest cities in the region. Um, in fact, I, 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 I put an image up here. Did we get the image there? Um, you see how that's the whole area there? And it's right dab in the middle. You see a river coming right through there. It was a, leave that up there for a minute, but it, it was a main thoroughfare for people who were industry, shipping goods, carrying goods from one place to the other. They all went through that area because it was very central. It was very, you know, um, a peak place, whether you were doing it by, by, by ship or if you were doing it by some other means, you all went through there. But here's what I found interesting this week. Um, as I was doing this, you, you look up at the very top left, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. What do you know about those churches? Those are the seven churches that were written about in the book of Revelation. So it's interesting to know that they were as close, they were, they were very close in proximity to all this. This is in what is modern day Turkey today, um, the southwest portion of that. And so again, that's very interesting to see because as being the center of trade, it was a very, very, very diverse, multicultural type of place. Um, because there were people coming through there, people who lived there, people who had their businesses there from all over the region. Region. And so this week when I was trying to think of what I could compare that to, the, really the, the only places I could come up with would be somewhere like New York City, uh, a lot of different nationalities there, maybe Los Angeles, maybe Miami, just a lot of different nationalities there, very diverse. Um, it was populated by both Hebrews and the Greeks, um, and so it had different religious beliefs there. It had all sorts of things that were going on in that area, in that city. Now, we find in verse 7 and 8 of Colossians chapter 1 that there's a guy named Epaphras. Epaphras, and here's what it says about him. It says, you learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love about he has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Epaphras was a guy who many believe was he was actually converted, he was actually led to Christ by Paul in Ephesians, in Ephesus. And but he was from Col Colossae. I'm gonna say that wrong the whole series. So but he was from this town. So it was like he had gotten saved here, he had came back to his hometown, and he had begun to share the gospel. People People had begun to believe this church of the, of the church of the Colossians uh, had developed, and here's where the book comes from. He asked Paul to write a letter to the church because because of all the different religions and all the different nationalities and all the different culturals that were there, people were trying to change and dilute the gospel. 
to the point that some were trying to say that Jesus was not the Son of God, that he was merely maybe a really good teacher, maybe a prophet, but he was not the Son of God. And that is one of the things that in the Christian belief, in the Christian faith, that is uh, primary. It's a primary doctrine to understand, believe, and know, and live according to the fact that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God. So in this very diverse, very multicultural, very different religious beliefs, there were some people who were saying, hey, I could go along with a lot of what you're saying. I don't think Jesus was the Son of God. And there were people there in the church getting swayed. They were getting swayed back and forth. Do I believe this guy? Do I believe this person? This person's my neighbor. And they came over and we had a talk and it made really good sense. And, and this person I, I do business with and we had a talk today at lunch and it made really good sense. And so people were getting swayed back and forth. And so Epaphras asked Paul, will you please write a letter to the church to explain to them the, the important doctrines of the gospel so that they could know that they know that they know that they know. And regardless of who they talk to, regardless of the situation they may find themselves in or whatever they may, may happen, that, that these are the important doctrines of the faith. Now, I know that doesn't seem like real exciting stuff, but let me ask you this. How many of you have just learned something about the book of Colossians that you didn't know before? All of us, many of us. See, that's sort of what we're going to do over these next four weeks is hopefully um, come to understand more about this book, the author, the topic, what it's pointing to, who it's pointing us to, and how we can apply it to our lives. That's really the, the end goal because I can tell you whatever I want to in here, but how you live out there uh, is very, very important. And so that's our goal for this. And so today we're going to take chapter 1. Next week we'll take chapter 2. Then we'll do chapter 3. Then we'll do chapter 4. And we'll be through the book of Colossians. Now again, like I said earlier, we can't read every verse um, out of each chapter. But let me just, today we're going to focus in on verses 15 down to about uh, 20, I believe. Maybe even a little further uh, than that. Here's the theme of Colossians chapter 1. And it is Christ is supreme. Christ is supreme. Can I just tell you this? You've heard this phrase before probably. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. Jesus is supreme. And Paul goes through these next few verses and makes a fourfold argument. He tells the church, again, so they can drop their roots, so they can know for sure that Jesus is supreme. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just maybe a prophet. He wasn't just someone who, who came along. He literally is the Son of God. And in that, he is supreme. The first point that Paul makes in verses 15, 15 to 17, is that Paul is supreme in creation. A creation. It says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. That was one of the things that, that these other cultures, these other religions were trying to, to refute. They were trying to say he isn't God. He, he's a lot of things. We've heard about his teaching, but he wasn't God. And I love how uh, Paul says it right here that he is. He didn't say he probably is. He might be. He could be. Maybe he says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before everything, before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things that we can't see such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. So the first thing that Paul tells these guys here, writes to this church, is that Christ is supreme over all creation. In fact, he breaks it down three ways. He says that he was before all of creation, through him all of creation was made, and through him all of creation is held together. So we use words today like universe and planets and earth and sun and moon and gravity and rain and wind. And we say otter and beaver and platypus, water cycle. And it's all held together by the power of Jesus' name. The farmer needs the rain. 
and it's held together by Jesus' name. The children love to go out and play in the warm weather. They love to be on the swing set uh, when it's beautiful days like we've had recently. People love to flock to the beach and, and hear the crash of the waves coming in and, and just go and put their feet in there or whatever. And so often what happens to us is that we begin to worship the creation and forget the creator. We, we enjoy, I, I don't know how many of you were out yesterday, first day of hunting season. You enjoy the crisp, cool morning at 5 a.m. when it's pitch dark and you're going out there to hunt a deer. And you sit in a stand, up in a tree, maybe all day long, waiting, looking, hunting. Maybe you take a boat out on the lake and you go fishing and you throw your, your rod and your reel out and you, you wind it up trying to catch a fish. All of these things that we do, we enjoy the creation of God. And so many times as believers, and, and, and in our world in general, but as believers even, we forget the creator. We forget the one who causes the sun to rise and causes it to set in the evening. We, we, we forget the one who, who created the ocean and all that is in there. We, create, we forget the one uh, who created all these different kinds of birds and all of these different animals and all of these different fish. We forget the creator because we worship the creation. And that's one of the things that, that Paul was trying to say to these people is that Christ is supreme. And while the creation around us is awesome and incredible, the Creator Himself is supreme over all of it. The second thing, the second point that Paul makes in verse 18, he says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is His body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So He is first in everything. He says that He is the head of the church. No pastor, no priest, no parishioner runs the church. It's Christ church. Now, maybe you have been around church long enough or been in church long enough. You, you realize that there is a local body of believers and there's a worldwide body of believers. Today, sometime, I'm not sure the time difference, but today there will be people worshiping the same God we worship, the same Jesus Christ we worship in China and in Africa and in Ukraine and in Honduras and, and all over the world today. People will be wishing, worshiping the same God that we worship today. That's we're part of the worldwide church. Together, as a body of believers, we worship God and we worship His Son, Jesus Christ. And even today, in this building, under this roof, there's a local group of people. There's a local body of believers. And today, right now, through the music and through His Word, we're worshiping the same God and the same Creator. And we need to understand and realize that Jesus is the head of the church. He calls us, as His church, the Bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. And his love for the bride, his love for the church, was obviously proven to us on the cross. It was a cruel cross. It was a, a terrible punishment. It was a terrible pain. It, the whips and the, the beatings and the crowns and the nails and all of that, that that hung him up there on the cross. But he did that because he loved his bride. He loved the church. One of the ways if you ever get into this predicament of trying to understand maybe what church I should be involved in or whatever is just try to find out what the, the preacher or the pastor or the, the bishop or whatever believes about their church because it's not our church. This is not Rick's church. Some people will say that. Well, tell me about your church. I don't have a church. I'm working in God's church. This is His church. We are His believers. We, we are worshiping Him. We are surrendering to Him. We are letting Him guide us and give us vision and, and, and understanding to give us a mission to accomplish. But this is not my church. And the cool thing about that is because it's not my church, if I drop dead on this platform today, though it would cause a little hubbub there for a few minutes, I guess. Uh, uh, maybe not. Maybe I'll just go go, cool illustration. But um, but this church would go on. You see, it's not based on me. It's not run on me. It's not it's not me that keeps it running. And if you ever go to a church where where the pastor is that, where the pa it's all about the pastor and it's all about him, then then you need to be very leery. John chapter three verse thirty, he said he must increase, talking about Christ, while I must decrease. 
He must increase while I must decrease. Christ is the head of creation. He is supreme. He holds it together. And he is also the head of the church. Paul goes on to make a third really important theological point here. Verse 19 to 23 he says, For God in all His fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through Him God reconciled everything to Himself. The point that Paul makes here, and we're going to continue to read, but the point he makes is that, that Christ is supreme in reconciliation. You see, when sin entered the world, there was a gulf, a chasm that, that was created between God and man. And it was, a, it was a chasm, it was a, a divide that man could not build a bridge across. It was a chasm, it was a divide that, that good works could not get you to the other side to where God was. It was a chasm, it was a divide that, that religion couldn't get you to the other side where God was. And yet Jesus Christ came and in reconciliation built the bridge between God and man. It is through Jesus Christ that God has reconciled us through him. Continue in verse 20, it said, He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. And yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Do not drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news or you heard the gospel. You see, Jesus Christ is supreme in reconciliation. He took you from being an enemy of God to being a friend of God. He took you from being outcast from God as his enemy to bringing him into the presence of God as his child. Uh, I want you to think about this for a minute. Imagine your worst enemy comes to your door and knocks. And you open the door and it's your worst enemy there. And they say, I need a cup of sugar. And you just slam the door in their face. And a minute or two later, they knock again, and you go back there, and they say, I need a cup of sugar. And you're like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, you're like my arch enemy, and you slam the door in their face again. I need a cup of sugar. This time you go get your gun, and you're just sort of like, look, I'm not giving you any sugar. You're my arch enemy. Why would I ever do that to you? But, but I'm just letting you know I'm going to my armory back in the back. Uh, you don't want to knock on my door again. You slam the door. I need some sugar. You see, many times God has knocked and we have slammed the door. Many times God has said, hey, I want to receive you to myself. I want to bring you to myself. I want to reconcile you. I want, to help, I want to help bring you across that bridge from being an enemy of mine to being a child of mine. And we slam the door. Many times God speaks to our hearts and he knocks on our hearts and we open the door and he's there. And sometimes he, you understand the very fact. Tucker and I were talking earlier about, about just this, this, this deep theological thing that hit him in the shower this morning. I just told him he need to take more showers. Because it's just the more we understand how far we are from God, the more we understand how much has been done to bring us to God. Paul is writing to this church and he tells them, you have to stand firm in this. This was part of why they were waffling around. Because maybe one day they felt, they felt like Jesus was with them and then maybe one day they felt like he wasn't. He was like, you need to know, you need to nail down, you need to understand and stand firm in this. That Jesus is supreme in reconciling us to God. Now folks, that's what you live in. 
But when you can walk outside of these walls and know that tomorrow, regardless of what you're going to face, regardless of what your boss may say to you, regardless of how your business deal may go, regardless of how your kids are going to act, regardless of what's going to go wrong at your house, regardless of all that, when you can understand that God, through Jesus Christ, has brought you to himself. He has reconciled you. He has filled the gap, filled the bridge that sin created. So not only does he say Jesus is supreme in the creation, not only does he say he's supreme in the church, not only does he say that he is supreme in reconciliation, but Paul even goes on to make this point, that he is supreme in Paul's ministry. You have to understand, Paul was like a rock star at this point. There were people who wanted to have Paul come to their city, come preach in our city, come preach in our church, come visit our people. He was sort of like today's modern day traveling evangelist. I mean, people were sending him letters. Hey, come see us. Hey, come see us. Hey, come, come encourage us. Hey, come speak to our church. Come to our town. We'll have a revival. They were doing all of this and Paul makes this humble point that Jesus is supreme even in his ministry. Verse 24, he says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. And again, remember, Paul is in prison. So when he says, I suffer, literally he is suffering. Sometimes we read that verse and we say, well, what was going on to Paul? What was he suffering from? He was in prison. It wasn't a cakewalk. It wasn't a great place to be. Verse 25, he says, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And remember, this very diverse city, very diverse place that he's, he's writing this letter to. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. And this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. <coughs> we want to present them to God, perfect in the relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. See, Paul says to the people, look, I know, I know everybody wants me to come to their place. Everybody wants me to come speak to their church. Everybody wants me to come encourage their people. But you need to understand that it is Christ's power working in me, not me. And the reason he tells them that is so they can realize that regardless of where they're at, regardless of what they're facing, that it is Christ's power living in them as well. Paul's essentially saying, you don't need me to come talk to you. You don't need me to come see you. Why? Because you have the same Christ living inside of you. You have been reconciled to the same God that I've been reconciled to. You were a sinner just as I was a sinner. You are growing in your faith just as I'm growing in my faith. I don't need to come see you. You just need to know that Christ is in you. And be steadfast and be firm in that. Don't get blown to and fro. Don't get pushed around. Don't get confused by all these different conversations and religions that are in your city. Know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ lives in you. And it's His mighty power that works in our lives. And if you're here today and you're a believer in Christ, and you've come to that point of, of understanding that you were, you were a sinner and, and that Jesus Christ loved you enough that he died on the cross uh, for your sins, and you've come to that place of asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and, and asking him to come and be live into your life and surrender your life to him, and you're a believer today, that same Christ lives inside of you, the same one that lived inside of Paul. It's not a different one. It's not a 2017 version, a 2.0. It's, it's the same Christ that lives inside of you. You have the same working, mighty power of Christ inside of you that those people had, that Paul had. So how do you live your life knowing these truths? How do you live your life if you nail that down? Well, you could choose to live your life one of three ways. One, you could live a very frustrated life trying to be supreme. A lot of people try it. 
You, you could try to live to where I am supreme. I, I, I'm my own king. I make my own rules. I do my own thing. God, I, I got you penciled in Sunday morning at 10. But other than that, I'm the king. I'm supreme. And you could try to live a life like that. I could give you story after story after story after story of people who have tried to live like that. Most of them, at some point in time, end up in my office or a counselor's office. Why? Well, I'm so frustrated. Why are you frustrated? And it all comes back to the fact that they're trying to be supreme. They're trying to be the king of their life. So you could try to live a life where you're supreme. You'll be very frustrated. Or you can do what some have done, and you can literally fight a battle that you will not win. You can fight a battle that you will not win. You, there'll be days when you feel like you're winning, but you won't win. There'll be some people around you that'll tell you you're winning, but you won't win. When you try to be supreme instead of making Christ supreme in your life, you could try to play that game and you could try to live that life, but you will not win. The third way you can live your life is to submit to Christ who is supreme. You can live a life of submission to Christ, recognizing and understanding that He is supreme. And you can submit your life to Him. And you can submit your life to His hand. And you can submit your life to Him in your job, in your career, in your marriage, in your raising your kids. You can submit your life to Him, recognize and understand that He is supreme. See, that's what this church was having to deal with. How do I live life day in, day out? I've heard this good news. I've heard the gospel. Many of them had accepted Christ. They were, they were there at the church. But they were saying, how do I live day in, day out? And Paul is saying to them, live knowing that Christ is supreme. When we live a life knowing that Christ is supreme, it shines a light to everybody around us. There, there are some people, there was a guy just this week, uh, had a lot of time to look on Facebook this week, uh, sitting in the hospital room. Uh, and there was a guy I haven't seen in years. Uh, I probably haven't seen him in at least five years, maybe six or seven years. And, and uh, I didn't know where he was at, didn't know what he was doing or whatever. But he was one of those guys, and many of you know him, and if I said his name, you would go, oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's a buddy of a buddy of a buddy, and so uh, just through linking through Facebook, I, I, I got to him and, and found out, and, and here's all I can remember about this guy. I can't tell you where he came from. I, I can tell you now where he's at. He's in Atlanta, but uh, here's all I can remember about that guy. He was infectious for Christ. What does that mean? He was one of those people that was so in love with Christ that other people, like a magnet, were drawn to him. They, if you'd be in a coffee house, he would be the one that everybody was gathered around his table. Not because of who he was. Not because of a personality trait or good looking or any of that. He literally was just that infectious with Christ. He knew that Christ was supreme. He had surrendered his life to Christ. He said, God, you know, use me in every aspect. And that's all I can remember about that guy. When we live a life that way, when we live a life that Christ is supreme in our lives, it will be infectious to others. It will be infectious to, to our classmates. It will be infectious to our, our teachers. It will be infectious to our co-workers. It will be infectious to our bosses, our neighbors. When we can live a life knowing that Christ is supreme in us.